I'm so humbled and honored to be here with all of you today and to support a remarkable and courageous leader, Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky. It's also a great honor to serve as co-chair of this powerful event with the Honorable Lauren Beth Gash. So my relationship with Jan grew from the time when I was working for immigrant and refugee rights during the fallout from welfare reform in the late 1990s. As we fought for the reinstatement of benefits for immigrants and battled with the stifling and inefficient and disrespectful INS, Immigration Naturalization Service. As I look back at those times, I remember spending a lot of time in front of the Immigration Naturalization Service's offices downtown with lines wrapping around the city blocks. And I was standing there not because I was applying for citizenship, I was applying, I was standing there because we were exercising our First Amendment right of speech and protesting the poor service to immigrants and refugees. What I also remember is that Jan was often there with us. One particular day, she stood in line with hundreds of immigrants to see officers at the INS. She stood in line the whole entire day, talking with the men and the women and learning their stories. Fast forward more than 15 years later, immigrant rights is again in the spotlight as our country debates how we value the invisible women and men who have lived and worked in this country for years. With comprehensive immigration form on the nation's docket, I would like to put a finer point at this event in particular and to raise up the issues related to undocumented immigrant women. I think it's important to say that when we provide opportunity and equality for immigrant women, we provide it for all women. Jan knows this and leads a coalition against immigration reforms that limit visas for family members and was a key leader and advocate for VAWA. All I can say is thank goodness to all of you for your support and the voters in the 9th Congressional District that we have Jan in Congress. I thank Jan for inviting me to serve as co-chair. I truly feel not worthy. Um, great gratitude to my guests and friends and colleagues who served as hosts and as guests of mine. And with that, I know that we are all here to hear from Jan and Cecile. So I will turn it over to Lauren Beth Gash to bring us closer to that. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm so honored to be co-chairing this incredible event with my wonderful co-chair, Grace Ho. I believe I've been at every one of these lunches since the very first. It's hard to believe it's actually the 17th annual Power Lunch. It's so great to see so many of you here today to support Jan and her tireless work on behalf of all of us. We're really lucky here in Illinois that we have some wonderful Democratic statewide elected officials. We thought we'd give, we thought we'd give those in attendance today the opportunity to take a minute to speak to you. I've had the chance to work with all of these office holders, and I can tell you firsthand they are true leaders. A little piece of trivia here. My husband and I are both Georgetown Law graduates, as is our Lieutenant Governor, Sheila Simon, who was actually in our class. And Governor Pat Quinn and Attorney General Lisa Madigan both did their undergraduate studies at Georgetown University. So I'm considering this a little mini reunion. Moving on, I would like to introduce our Governor, Pat Quinn. Where is Pat? Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Uh, I want to thank Jan Schakowsky for her lifetime of leadership, and she understands how important it is to organize. I had the opportunity to meet Jan back in 1976 when she was fighting for consumers, fighting for making sure that everybody gets a fair shake, and she's been fighting for the common good and justice ever since. I want to really spe uh, say that this year in particular is an important year for all of us in Illinois and America. We're going to be implementing the Affordable Care Act that Jan led the charge for in Washington with our president. Yeah. 
Obamacare means I do care. And we want to make sure that everyone's in and nobody's left out when it comes to access to health care. And I think that what's so important about this gathering today with so much talent and so much energy is that we understand in a power lunch, it's everybody in, involved. And it's important that our state understand and everyone in Illinois understand that there's tremendous power in women when it comes to business. And this morning, I was at a place called 1871 at the Merchandise Mart, and I met a young woman there who started a business in her apartment. Uh, it's called Everpurse. I've never held and walked around with a purse before. Everpurse.com. And Liz Salcedo, who started this business with two or three people, they now have 10 people, you can put your cell phone in this purse and it charges the cell phone. This is what Illinois is all about. We've got the best people in the world right here in Illinois, and it begins with Jan Schakowsky and this power lunch, and let's go make the will of people law of the land. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. And now our um, Lieutenant Governor, Sheila Simon. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jan, for inviting me here today. I love your lunch. I hate your TV screens because I'm worried right now that I have salad in my teeth. So I apologize if I do. Hey, I am glad to be with a room full of powerful women. It makes me think of my two favorite powerful women, my daughters, Riley and Brennan, who are 23 and 18. They were youngsters when I was a prosecutor, and they grew up around law enforcement officers. And I remember when one of them came home from preschool and said, Mommy, we had a safety talk today from a police officer. And then she paused and she said, he was a boy. And I thought, nice world that they are growing up in. I love it. But that world got a rude wake-up call last fall when Congressman Aiken talked about legitimate rape and secretions. Exactly. And my younger daughter said, Mommy, he is a congressman? <laughs> the outrage was not just in her voice, it was in her fingertips. It was in her text, in the links that she was posting, and it went out to friends around Southern Illinois and Missouri and everywhere, and I'm convinced that it's because of young women like her that we re-elected Claire McCaskill. So way to go, powerful young women. So we are a very powerful bunch right here, and if we can combine with that next generation of powerful young women, there is nothing that can stop us. Nothing that can stop us from preventing violence at home and the kind of violence that keeps people at home. And we can do that, and together we can also make sure that Robin Kelly and Jan Schakowsky stay in their place, which is the U.S. House of Representatives. Thank you very much. And now our Attorney General, Lisa Madigan. Thank you, Lauren, and good afternoon. Everybody in the room who is a Jan fan, let's give it up for Jan Schakowsky. thank Jan for having another fabulous Women's Power launch, but I also want to take a moment to stress how important it is that she brings all of us women and good men together every single year. Because we are able to celebrate not just Jan's great and necessary and inspirational work, but we are also able to celebrate each other. And I want to tell you a quick story. So this past winter, I was at an event, and one of the people there looked around the room, saw the ratio of men to women, and then he looked at me and he said, are you always surrounded by this many men? And I said, yes, yes I am. So I have a pretty strong suspicion that every woman in this room has been in a room at one time or another and looked around and asked that same question of herself. Because all too often, at the highest levels of government in corporate America, there is only one woman in the room. But 
When there is a room full of women, like there is at Jan's Power Lunch, something powerful happens. We are at our most influential, we are at our strongest when we are together. And it is because of the women who came before us. It is because of Cecile's mother, the fabulous former governor of Texas, Ann Richards. And it is because of our own Illinois pioneer, our dear friend who we just lost, Dawn Clark Netch. It is because of them that trails were blazed and that the notions of what is and is not women's work were challenged. And it is because of these women that more doors were opened for me, for Jan, for Sheila, for Cecile, for Robin, for every single woman here. We are able to be sitting in a room together with other women, celebrating all that Jan has accomplished. But we have still got a long way to go, baby. So I want to encourage you to please keep pushing to be in the room. Keep pushing each other into the room. Keep pushing so that our daughters and our granddaughters can be in a room so that one day, one day, someone is going to look around a boardroom or a courtroom or an oval room, and they are going to be compelled to ask, are you always surrounded by this many women? Thank you, Jan. They're all amazing. So I'm Lauren, I'm an attorney, a member of the Democratic State Central Committee, a commissioner on the Illinois Human Rights Commission and the founding chair of the 10th Congressional District Democrats, many of whom are here today. We've been working hard for many years to build democratic infrastructure in the 10th, putting volunteers to work, holding 10th Dems University events with nationally known speakers, um, doing candidate trainings for folks running for federal, state, and local offices, and training and staffing candidates at all levels of government throughout the 10th. Two years ago, we opened our Community Connection office in Waukegan, where we needed to engage more voters. And we implemented our motto that politics should be about more than just elections. It should be about making our world a better place. To that end, we trained more than 300 deputy registrar to go reg reg registrars to go register more voters. Our interview training workshops for those coming out of prison help reduce recidivism. And on May 16th, we'll host our third annual Prose and Poetry Slam and Awards Ceremony for high school students. And we put 70 trained lawyers on the streets on election day, making sure everyone entitled to vote could actually cast their vote. As some of you know, the decennial redistricting also changed the 10th a bit. A good chunk of the old 10th is now in Jan Schakowsky's 9th district. And these new constituents are so happy with their new representative. For too many years, over 30 for most of the district, over 150 for some of the district, if ever, um, we Democrats did not have a congressperson who we could count on. So for those years, we counted on our de facto congresswoman a bit to the south, Jan Schakowsky, who was always willing to help our candidates and always willing to help engage our volunteers. Jan was incredible and her, in, her help was immense. Finally, this year, we earned that Democratic congressperson we'd been working for for years, Congressman Brad Schneider. So back in 1990, when I was working on the Paul Simon for Senate campaign, I met a woman running for state representative from Evanston. That was Jan. She'd been an activist and a longtime consumer advocate who led the fight that put freshness dates on products in supermarkets. She won that race. Two years later, I joined her in the Illinois House of Representatives and saw even more clearly what a talented leader she really is. Everyone who watched her work was impressed. No one was surprised that in 1998, she was tapped to run for Congress, and we were so thrilled that she won that race as well. Jan Schakowsky has proven herself in Congress to be a key member and also a prominent leader in the House working closely with Nancy Pelosi. She serves in the House Democratic leadership and as Chief Deputy Whip and a member of the Steering and Policy Committee. She's also a member of the Energy and Commerce Committee where she works toward providing 
where she works toward providing universal health care coverage for all Americans. Jen also serves on the House Select Committee on Intelligence. She's a leading advocate for women's issues in Congress, and she served as the Democratic Vice Chair of the Bipartisan Women's Caucus. Jan's a citizen advocate, a grassroots organizer, an elected public official, and has fought throughout her entire career for economic and social justice and improved quality of life for all, for an end to violence against women, and for a national investment in health care, public education, and housing needs. That consumer advocate who led the fight in 1969 for freshness dates continues to carry on the fight to this day in Congress with efforts to safeguard the rights of victims of identity theft and to protect consumers from predatory lenders. Jan's a well-known champion for our nation's seniors and persons with disabilities. We in Illinois are so proud that she is one of ours. We're proud when we see her so eloquently advocate for our cause so frequently on the national news shows, when we watch her step off Air Force One with our president, and we know she has been bending his ear on our behalf. But many don't know, and many in this room don't know, how much she works behind the scenes for our Democratic candidates. Here in Illinois, where we couldn't possibly have picked up so many seats in 2012 without her strategic and fundraising leadership. But also many don't know how many candidates across the country, some of whom are actually in this room, who are now new Congress people, benefited so significantly from her help. Jan provides them with strategic help, and her fundraising on behalf of established and startup candidates has made the difference in so many cases and is continuing to strengthen the pipeline for the future. Those candidates, especially those of whom are here today, and all of us owe her a great debt of gratitude. I would like to introduce my former seatmate in Springfield and my good friend, Jan Schakowsky. You are so beautiful. Thank you so much. I'm so thrilled to see all of you. Thank you. My favorite day. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Grace Ho and Lauren Beth Gash for being the co-chairs of this event. I want to thank all of the members of the host committee for putting together such a beautiful event. But I want to give a very special thanks for putting together her 10th Ultimate Women's Power Lunch, Sarah Gersten, my finance director. Along with her assistant, Jackie Tewitt, and all of my staff and volunteers, uh, this is just such a fabulous event. It energizes me, and I hope it energizes you as well. Um, I, I want to, um, as always, um, begin by introducing all of the elected officials here. Um, I, I want you to know this is a very important part of the event for, for me because I know how it feels to sit in an audience and I want to acknowledge the people who have put themselves out there, run for, uh, for, for office now and some who have, uh, who have retired since. So first of all, um, of the Illinois delegation that is here, Tammy Duckworth, Congresswoman from the 8th District. A real star, a real star. We have Bill Foster, from, Congressman from the 11th District. And um, Brad Schneider is just returning from Israel, but his wife Julie is here. We're so grateful for, that Brad is now Lawrence Congressman in the 10th District. And in a minute, I'm going to bring her up because I want to make sure everybody gets a good look at Robin Kelly, our newest congresswoman from the second district. I'm so glad you heard from our statewide elected officials, Pat Quinn, our governor, Sheila Simon, our lieutenant governor, Lisa Madigan, our attorney general. Thank you so much. It's an honor that you're here. Statewide, I also want to mention a, a, a dear friend, former state representative, and now director of the Illinois Department of 
uh, of Health and Family Services, uh, the woman who is helping to implement Obamacare in Illinois, Julie Hamos. And also um, from the state, Jay Rowell, Director of the Illinois Department of Employment Security. Thank you for being here. Illinois State Senators, John Cullerton, President of the Illinois State Senate. Daniel Biss, the 9th, 9th District. Mike Frericks from Downstate, 52nd District. We have Toy Hutchinson from the 40th District. And Julie Morrison from the 29th District. Mike Nolan, the 22nd District, and Iris Silverstein of the 8th District in Illinois. State Senators, thank you. We have the Cook County elected officials. Tony Preckwinkle, President of the Cook County Board. Thank you, Tony. My good friend, great leader, Tony Preckwinkle. Our Cook County State's Attorney, Anita Alvarez. Our Clerk of the Circuit Court, Dorothy Brown. Karen Yarborough, our Recorder of Deeds. And Deborah Shore, a great leader and environmentalist from the Metropolitan Re Water Reclamation District. And her colleague, Mariana Spiropoulos, Commissioner of the MWRD. We have City of Chicago officials, Susanna Mendoza, our City Clerk. Alderman Will Burns of the 4th Ward. James Kappelman of the 29th Ward. No, I'm sorry, of the 46th Ward. And former Alderman of the 46th Ward, Helen Schiller is here as well. Deborah Graham, Alderman of the 29th Ward. Mary O'Connor of the 41st Ward. Deborah Silverstein, 50th Ward, where I grew up. Mona Noriega, Chairman of the Chicago Commission on Human Relations. We've got a bunch of municipal officials from my hometown of Evan Evanston, including um, the, oh, I thought the mayor, no, she's not here, okay. Um, Pat Vance, our Evanston Township Supervisor. Bonnie Wilson, our Evanston Township Assessor. And the Alderman, Colleen Burris, Jane Grover, Dolores Holmes, Ann Rainey, Mark Tendum, and Melissa Wynn. The Mayor of Highland Park is here, Nancy Rotering. And the District, District 113 School Board, Annette Lidauer. District 102 School Board, Scott Lynn. Highland Park City Council, Alyssa Noble. Northfield Township Trustee, Mary Reynolds. District 112 School Board, Yumi Ross. President of the Park Ridge Park District, Mary Wynn Ryan. From the judiciary, the, uh, from the Supreme Court of Illinois, Mary Jane Tice. We have, we have judges, Greg Ahern, Carol Bellows, Jean Cleveland Bernstein, Steve Bernstein, Diana Embel, Deborah Gerb Gubin, Nathaniel House, Jr., Sharon Johnson, James Kaplan, Themis Carnesis, Bernita Lampkin, Mark Lopez, Claire McWilliams, Martha Mills, Leonard Murray, Jessica O'Brien, Jesse Reyes, Naomi Schuster, Mary True, Raul Vega, Deborah Walker, and Kem Ken Wright. We have Democratic Party officials. You've already met Lauren Beth Gash, who runs the most dynamic organization, the 10th District Dems. From New Trier Township, it's committeeman Dean Maragos. <laughs> Billy Maravitz, 9th District State Central committeeman, former senator. Carol Ronan, my dear friend, 48th Ward committeeman and 9th District State Central committee woman and former state senator. Nancy Shepherdson, 8th District State Central Committee Woman. And former elected and appointed officials, Art Berman, State Senator, J.D. Bindenagel, U.S. Ambassador to Germany, John Cox, U.S. Congressman, former U.S. Congressman, Judy Irwin, former State Rep, Alexi Genulius, 
former state treasurer, Anjana Hansen, former Evanston alderman, Rex Parker from Park Ridge, former alderman, Judy Rice, the former Chicago city treasurer, Helen, oh, I mentioned Helen Scherler, I'll mention her again, Carol Spielman, Lake County commissioner. We also have honorary council general of Nepal, Marvin Brewston, who is here as well. Let's give all of them a great round of applause. And, oh, from the 43rd Ward, Alderman Michelle Smith, a good friend, is here as well. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I, I want to, um, at this point, uh, bring up to the front, because I want you to get a good look at this wonderful woman. You know, um, state, um, Rob, Robin Kelly was a state representative, always advocate of a progressive agenda, consumer protection, economic development, raising the minimum wage, fighting domestic violence. She was the chief of staff of our state treasurer, Alexi Janulius, um, and a candidate herself for state treasurer, chief administrative officer of Cook County. She won the special election to replace Congressman Jesse Jackson, Jr. And she's a member of the Black Caucus. She's on two House committees already. But one of the things that was very present in her campaign, you know, most people aren't so proud of an F grade. But when it comes from the NRA, it's a good thing. So bring, let's come on up. Congresswoman Robin Kelly. Where are you, Robin? There she is. This is your show. I want you, though. Thank you so much. I told Jan this is her show, so I'm going to be short and sweet. But I've been in Illinois for, well, a long time now. But, and I heard about this woman, Jan Schakowsky, because I only lived in Peoria and in the south suburbs. But as I got more and more involved, you know, this woman that was up here that I heard about became more and more real. And I can tell you that she is fighting very hard for you in Washington, D.C. And not only for the ninth, she's fighting for the United States and she's fighting globally for women in particular. Every press conference I went to, Jan was there. And I, I was there. I was just hoping to be the congresswoman, not the congresswoman, so now I can be the congresswoman with her. But I'm happy to say, at, at my swearing in, uh, we took a picture and I became the fourth woman to represent Illinois, and I think that's the first time that ever happened. So, thank you so much. For Democratic women. Okay. Oh, okay, Evanston Alderman Pre Peter Braithwaite, my good friend, glad to see you here too. Well, I, I want to make a, a couple of other special uh, announcements. I want you to know there is a table here today in memory of a really great friend. You saw um, our, our tribute to Dawn Clark Netch, I'll, I'll mention her later, but we lost another dear, dear friend someone who was part of this lunch, but part of the city inspiring so many women, and that is our good friend, Helen Doria, who is so deeply missed. Let's clap for her. There's also a table from the group Girls in the Game, courtesy of Jill Allred, who could not be here. There are also tables of young, uh, leadership, young Leadership Charter School students. We're so proud of you. Uh, one of the students in attendance, Kira Johnson, was just chosen as a Gates Millennium Scholar. Um, there, we have a table of Northwestern and Loyola students. Welcome. And those of you, I guess all of you who are on email, I want to announce that Jackie Grimshaw was our internet winner of a free ticket to the power launch. Okay, Jackie. Okay. <laughs> Great. I love Jackie. Thank you. Okay. We missed a few people. Okay. I want everybody. Thank you. Kim Stone. Newly elected Highland Park City Councilwoman. We've got a Andy Schleifer, judge. 
Thank, oh, my dear friend. And Amy, Z uh, Amy Zizek, what did she get elected to? From Moraine Township. Yay. And good for you, Amy. Okay. Okay. Well, I have a couple or two, three words to say. So, my dear sisters and very secure brothers, <laughs> it's the way I always begin. You know, it's always my hope that you leave this springtime lunch feeling more hopeful, powerful, self-confident, and more energized than when you arrived. I know I certainly do, thanks to you. Today, I'm going to take a big leap over all of the many specific challenges we're facing some of which you'll hear, from, hear about from the incomparable Cecile Richards to suggest a more comprehensive solution. Today, I am asserting that humanity is at a crossroads on this small planet and that our survival as a species is dependent on women taking charge, taking the world in our own hands. Yep. I really do believe that we are a tipping point from which there could be no turning back, a turning point that the traditional male hierarchy of the world ignores at their peril, a peril that puts us all in unex unacceptable danger, actually of extinction. So let us begin the era of the woman. Okay. Okay, okay, maybe a little over dramatic. <laughs> All right, okay. But let me make my case. Charles Osgood said last, uh, Charles Osgood last Sunday hosted an interview about the evolution of man. And the experts said, quote, humans are going to change genetically to be able to interact with each other better in a social context because we've only started to do that. It's only been about 300 generations since we were all hunter-gatherers. There hasn't been very much time to adapt to being social, unquote. All right, two things about that. One, we were not all hunter-gatherers, or at least not all hunters. We were actually spending quality time in the cave, being collaborative and social. Discovering productive uses of fire, for example, and mediating fights among the children. <laughs> and second, women don't need 300 generations to adapt. More like five minutes. And as far as interacting in a social context, well, enough of us are seriously evolved in that department. So before I go any further, though, I must stipulate that my vision is impossible without the partnership of enlightened feminist men. Those men... Those men, decision makers, homemakers, elected officials, and peacemakers, must be part of our team. That includes, I suspect, all the men in this room. I'm not pandering, I'm just saying, I'm just saying. And let's be clear, not all women are or ever will be on our team either. But it is time to take our very evolved selves into leadership positions that would include top leadership positions. Think President Hillary Clinton, for example. The May, the May issue of The Atlantic includes an article entitled, quote, a, Wom a Woman's Edge, Why Both Political Parties Now Think That Voters Prefer Female Candidates, unquote. The article cites a 2009 study by uh, Deborah Jordan Brooks, who conducted a large survey of American adults that will be part of her upcoming book, He Runs, She Runs, Why Gender Stereotypes Do Not Harm Women Candidates. In her study, a candidate was described, and the study participants were asked to rate the candidate's characteristics. The only difference in the description was that for half of the participants, the candidate's name was Karen Bailey, and for the other half, Kevin Bailey. Turns out, 
that on traits such as competence, empathy, and ability to handle an international crisis, the candidates were viewed almost identically. Brooks concluded, quote, there is no indication that it is tougher for women than for men, unquote. The only exception to parity was in the scenario in which Karen and Kevin were described as first-time candidates with no experience in politics. Guess what? In this case, the inexperienced woman candidate was viewed as stronger, more honest, and more compassionate than the male candidate. <laughs> Time to step up, inexperienced women. Here's another one. Now, all you potential candidates listen, and I think there's probably hundreds of you in this room. Researchers Jennifer Lawson and Danny Hayes conducted a massive analysis of nearly 5,000 newspaper articles covering 342 congressional races and found that women candidates got as much coverage as men, were no more likely to be described in terms of their clothing, appearance, or family life, as likely to be portrayed as having leadership ability, and the study concluded Whatever's hindering women, it's not prejudiced news coverage. So why don't more women run? The same Jennifer Lawless did a study some years ago that I talked about in a previous lunch many years ago that found qualified women to be twice as likely as equally qualified men to describe themselves as not qualified to run for office. Sheryl Sandberg's blockbuster book, Lean In, Women Work, and the Will to Lead refers to several studies showing that women in the workplace are prone to think that they are less qualified for a promotion than they are, while men tend to see themselves as more qualified than they really are. <laughs> but frankly, I think we need a little bit more of that attitude. And men may be a little less, I don't know. Okay. Sandberg, uh, a top executive at Google, told in her, her book about posters that were on the wall at, at work. One said, what would you do if you weren't afraid? That's worth more than a, a moment's thought. Another said, done is better than perfect. Both, I think, speak especially to women and the obstacles we put in our own path. Fear of taking risks. Sometimes completely understandable, but sometimes not. And striving for perfection. The words I like to share to, with young women is to remember that sometimes adequate is adequate. Adequate means good enough. Don't be so hard on yourself. Done is better than perfect. But back to my beginning, why is it critical that women now step into the top leadership positions in the world and all its subdivisions? Certainly, we need for our own self-interest and that of our daughters and granddaughters. States are passing the worst anti-woman laws that we have ever seen. Women are brutalized and raped in, uh, in conflict and by custom. The worst victims of radical fundamentalism and sectarianism are women. But these conditions are actually fueling a resistance movement that is unstoppable, and it is un incumbent on us as the most fully resourced women in the world to step up and lead the way. Now, we have ample evidence of what happens when we do. Todd, women's bodies have a way of discerning legitimate rape, Aiken. <laughs> and Richard, pregnancy from rape is God's will, Murdoch are now in the Hall of Shame and not the Halls of Congress. Right. And, and Mitt, Planned Parenthood, I'll get rid of that, Romney, is the name Republicans will not speak. <laughs> Planned Parenthood, led by the literally unbeatable Cecile Richards, Let's clap right now for Cecile. <laughs> Planned Parenthood spent more money in the 2012 elections than the NRA, helped elect almost all of their endorsed candidates, in stark contrast to Karl Rove, 
Sheldon Adelson, the NRA, and Fox News. In Illinois, in Illinois, Personal PAC and the Pro-Choice Coalition made sure that pro-choice women and men knew about Bill Brady, and Pat Quinn was elected governor. Incredible young women like Sandra Fluck spoke for all young women of her generation for something as non-controversial, or at least we thought it was, as birth control. Imagine in 2013, 2012. The good news is almost all women and men agree with Sandra. There are a record number of women in Congress now. For the first time in the United, in the United States history, the majority of Democrats in the House of Representatives are women and minorities. <laughs> women, women make up 20% of the Senate, 18% of the House, but we're going for 50-50, or 60-40 is just fine by me. <laughs> women have been in the forefront of the Arab Spring protests. Nuns are getting on the bus. God bless Sister Simone. And, cha and, and challenging the bishops, even got the bishops to call Paul Ryan's anti-poor people budget immoral. Women of the Wall in Israel just won a court battle to be able to pray at the Western Wall as they choose. There are fierce women and girls of enormous courage standing up and running for office, insisting on their rights in the most dangerous places in the world. Girls like teenage Malala, shot in the head in Pakistan, said that the happiest moment in her life was the opening of a new school for 40 girls. She said, let us turn 40 girls into 40 million girls. Huge, huge and sustained women-led protests took place in India over a brutal rape and murder of a woman on the bus. And women are taking leadership roles in peacemaking. As Ambassador Swani Hunt, a remarkable woman um, who has been training and supporting women waging peace, said, quote, relying on the same men who made war to make peace is a bad habit. Women are in the forefront of the fight against ga gun violence. We have new players. Gabby Giffords and her husband formed a new super PAC, Americans for Sensible Solutions. There's, there's mothers demand action for gun sense in America, and moms rising in ultraviolet, as well as mayors against illegal guns and the Brady campaign. There is a significant gender gap when it comes to support for common sense gun uh, violence prevention measures, women in every community, city and suburbs, Democrats and Republicans prioritize safe schools, movie theaters, safe neighborhoods, and the freedom to live without fear of being shot or sending our children to school. Since the vote defeating background checks, senators who voted no have seen their support plummet. We can win this, but not without women. Women are stepping up to save the planet as a place that can sustain human life. Women want breathable air, clean, accessible water, and crops that survive a growing season. Women are not so intoxicated by the promise of petrodollars gained by drilling and fracking and pipelines like Keystone XL and cutting off the tops of their mountains. In this room is Kimberly Wasserman. Where are you, Kimberly? Where is she? There she is. I'll tell you about her. She's of the Little Village Justice Organization, winner of the Goldman, Goldman Environmental Prize and the $150,000 that goes with it. She led the campaign to close Chicago's Fisk and Crawford power plants, the nation's <laughs> oldest and dirtiest coal-fired plants. Kimberly, a single mom, began her fight when her infant son was gasping for air. She went door to door with her baby, 
recruiting more and more moms. And with the help of 35 Chicago aldermen and Mayor Emanuel, the plants were closed in 2012. Thank you, Kimberly. <laughs> Women are fighting to change the workplace. Organizations like Chicago's Women Employed are taking on the wage gap. Women earn an average of 77 cents to every dollar men earn, 64 cents for black women, women 56, for 56 cents for Latinas. The Paycheck Fairness Act, sponsored by Senator Barbara Mikulski of Maryland, has 43 co-sponsors, 17 more to get to 60. And by my dear friend Rosa DeLauro in the House, and we need to elect only 17 more Democrats in the House of Representatives to again make my personal hero, Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House. And when we do, and when we do, we will pass paycheck fairness, count on it. And let me say about Nancy. Remember that every one of the great accomplishments of our enlightened President Barack Obama could not have happened without Nancy Pelosi's tough and smart leadership, including Obamacare, which finally makes it clear that being a woman is not a pre-existing condition. Making Nancy Pelosi the speaker means we have to re-elect our fabulous Illinois de delegation of Democratic congressmen and women and hopefully add to it. So I want you to know, when you support me, you also help me support our candidates directly and through the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, so I thank you for that. Nancy Pelosi announcement and President Barack Obama are coming to Chicago on May 29th, fundraising for the DCCC, and we'd love you to join us. Call us for details. <laughs> Aging is a woman's issue. We live longer and we are poorer. Wage discrimination follows us into retirement, giving women lo lower Social Security benefits. The average benefit is $13,000 a year for women, and many that's their only income. You hear the talk about raising the age of Social Security and Medicare because everyone is living longer, but that's actually not true. People in the upper half of income, they live longer. For the bottom half, longevity has flattened out and poor women are actually living shorter lives. That's a fact. So when we hear about even so-called modest cuts in benefits, we need to say no no matter who is proposing them. Well, in, in a few weeks, I will be celebrating my 69th birthday, clearly a senior citizen with a new hairdo. But for anyone who's interested, serving in Congress is my retirement plan. Just want you to know that. <laughs> My plan. And part of that plan is to be part of the old girls network that nurtures, mentors, and knocks on doors for the young women who will take my place. We lost our leader of the old girls network a short time ago, the incomparable Don Clark Netch, who came to all 11 previous power lunches. I can still see her smile and feel her urging us all on. Let's give a round of applause to Dawn Clark Neff. I will close, I will close with this. It's all about women now. I believe that. This is our moment and we can't pass it up and we can't wait for the day or the year that seems more opportune. It's hard to argue that men haven't had their chance or that the result is not so hot, or actually maybe too hot. Some of them are frightened that we are a threat to their hegemony and, in the, and they are in the final throes of a tantrum about it. But women and men are ready to take a different path. Our daughters and sons, my daughter and son are here, 
and grandchildren, and my grandchildren are here, are depending on us, even if they don't know it yet. Men will be better off not having the full weight of the world just on their shoulders, and our sisters around the globe need us desperately, and we are up to the task. And if you doubt me, just look around the room. Let us begin the era of the woman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's true, girlfriends. We're going to do it. Right. Those of you who may not be acquainted with Cecile Richards have not had the privilege of hearing her speak or seeing her on her frequent television appearances. Always looking beautiful. Oh, and smart and everything good. Or reading her powerful arguments on Huffington Post you will soon understand why Cecile Richards has become the most prominent and dynamic voice in America advocating for women's health and reproductive rights. Cecile is the president of Planned Parenthood Federation of America and the Planned Parenthood Action Fund, a national organization that has worked for nearly 100 years to build a safer world for women and teens. Planned Parenthood serves nearly 3 million patients, women of all ages, and men. Gentlemen, I just learned they actually perform vasectomies there. Just, just saying. Okay. Um, three, 3 million patients every year through its 750 affiliate health centers nationwide. It provides sex education based on facts and not made up stuff, which is really good to more than one million people, and its website, PlannedParenthood.org, receives 43 million visits each year from individuals seeking health care services and education in both English and Spanish. Last evening, Planned Parenthood Illinois had a fabulous gala at Navy Pier. I know some of you were there, and so let me take a moment to congratulate and thank our fabulous Illinois leaders of Planned Parenthood, President Carol Bright, Ms. Carol, and Vice President Pam Sutherland, Let's hear it for them. At that event, I happened to inquire about the uh, health of an elderly gentleman friend, and he replied, I'm still here. And the same can certainly be said of Planned Parenthood. Despite all the political attacks, the votes to defund Planned Parenthood, despite the physical attacks on clinics and providers and the harassing of patients, under Cecile's leadership, Planned Parenthood is not simply still here, but Planned Parenthood is bigger and stronger and younger than it has ever been. Its membership has doubled, and a large portion of the newbies being young people who just happen to be registered to vote, too. In addition to her many other skills, Cecile is one of the best organizers I know. Cecile played a major role in shaping the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, and succeeding in expanding services and coverage, including contraception for women. It wasn't easy, and it still isn't easy. Before joining Planned Parenthood in 2006, Cecile was Deputy Chief of Staff for Nancy Pelosi. She began her career, listen up young women, organizing low-wage workers in the hotel, healthcare, and janitorial industries. Great way to, uh, to do good work and learn important skills. Cecile had the benefit of an amazing mentor. Her mother, Ann Richards, the former governor of Texas. Actually, from a distance, Ann Richards was a mentor for so many of us. Um, and from her mom, she inherited a commitment to social justice, public service, and a good sense of humor. 
I am very proud to call Cecile Richards my dear friend and honored to present her to you and you to her. Come on up, Cecile. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Thank you very much. Let's get a picture. Oh. Okay. <laughs> thanks. Thank you, Jan. Well, I'm a card carrying member of Jan's fans and so thrilled to be with all of you here today. Is there anyone in the room that is not related to Jan Schakowsky? <laughs> I feel like um, I met every one of her family and they're beautiful. Um, before I started, I just want to, I, I, as Jan said, I started out as a union organizer and for years organized garment workers and hotel workers and um, folks who cleaned office buildings. And so would you um, join me in thanking the folks who served us here today, which is, um, appreciate that very much. Uh, and congratulations to Laura, Laura Beth and Grace for an extraordinary event and to Carol and Pam and the whole Planned Parenthood family that is here, and folks who do extraordinary work uh, every single day caring for, for the women, men, and young people of the state of Illinois. So glad that they're here. Yeah, give it up for them, will you? They do amazing work in a very tough environment. So I was, um, was going to tell you, uh, you know, all the great things about Jan's history, um, but I think you know them. I mean, she is this extraordinary community organizer who made food safety a reality for you know everyone in the United States of America. But the, of course, the important thing is she then took those community organizing skills, honed it here in the streets of Chicago and in the aisles of Jewel, and uh, <laughs> took them to the US Congress. And she has, of course, becoming the first woman ever elected from the 9th Congressional District, but, uh, which is great. Um, but I, I think, as was mentioned now, we actually have 78 women in the House of Representatives and 20 in the United States Senate. And that is in large part because of Jan Schakowsky. Because that's just really, um, I love it because Jan, Jan does tell young women, you know, um, run for office and I'll help you because it's not just an old boys network, as she says, it's an old girls network as well. And so I do want to brag on her on one thing because it's been mentioned, the Affordable Care Act. I don't really know, think you have any idea how tough it is to fight for women's issues in the U.S. Uh, Congress. I'll just give an example. We actually had to have a fight in the United States Senate about whether maternity benefits would be covered under the Affordable Care Act. Eh. I know, it just like doesn't get much uh, easier than that. But literally, Senator John Kyle from Arizona, who will play a role later in our, uh, in our history, uh, said that he didn't think they should cover maternity benefits because, quote, he was never going to need them, <laughs> which would seem to be a fairly obvious point. But this is why we need more women in office, because immediately, Debbie Stabenow from the, from the state of Michigan, great state of Michigan, came right, right back around and said, well, I bet your mother did, <laughs> right? Uh, so, but that's why we need women as truth tellers. Um, but in a sense, but the thing that's important about the Affordable Care Act, and I'm, I'm glad that Governor Quinn mentioned it, is that, you know, a lot of important things happened. One is it was because of Nancy Pelosi and Jan Schakowsky that abortion rights were covered and protected in the Affordable Care Act. It never would have happened without them. Absolutely. But. For every woman you see, there's three things they got to know about the Affordable Care Act. One is for the first time, no more gender rating. You can't be charged more for insurance just because you're a woman. That's extraordinary. It's so important. Um, and as, as she mentioned, for the first time, your preventive care, and that means you know your breast, your breast exam and your regular women's checkup, and your birth control is now covered completely for no copay. That is absolutely revolutionary. And, the third thing, and probably the most important, is that for the first time, women cannot be de denied insurance coverage because they've survived breast cancer or domestic, exactly. And uh, so again, we can't say it too much, but being a woman for the very first time is no longer a pre-existing condition in America. And that's because of Jan Schakowsky and Nancy Pelosi. So thank them for what they, what they do. So, so as you've heard, um, so I, I come from Texas from a long line of ornery, outspoken women. Now, the story has it that my, my grandmother was um, at home in Waco, Texas, in labor, with my, uh, pregnant with my mother, and uh, there was a neighbor woman who uh, had come over to cook for my grandfather, because of course he couldn't cook dinner for himself, and 
it seems that the neighbor lady actually had no experience killing a chicken and that was what was for supper. So my grandmother hoisted herself up uh, on her elbow, reached out, and in the birthing bed, took that chicken and wrung its neck right there, uh, right there. <laughs> exactly. So that's the stock from which I come. And so when, uh, when we say don't mess with Texas women, that's the kind of thing we're talking about. Now, um, the great thing is, of course, um, in fact, back when my great-grandmother was a girl, the only folks who could not vote in Texas under Texas law were idiots, imbeciles, the insane, and women, right? But here's the great thing. Just two generations later, my mother was elected governor of the state of Texas, Ann Richards. That's what, that's what power is. So I'm with, um, I'm with Jan. It's like, get, women, just, get, we don't need 200 centuries. Just give us five minutes. Give us an inch. We'll take a mile. Um, and, and we've got to organize, because it's not news to anybody here these last couple of years. We have faced a record number of bills against women, against women's rights, an all-out assault. In fact, right after the 2010 elections, uh, right off the bat, you'd think at a time in which there was, you know, the economy was in a free fall, joblessness, you know, home foreclosures, total economic dislocation. What was the priority of the U.S. House of Representatives? It was to ban funding for Planned Parenthood and end family planning in the United States of America. Uh, that literally was the first thing they took up. But, but here's the good thing. So when they did, when they voted to defund Planned Parenthood, it was like dropping a match on dry kindling, you know? Because it was like the great alumni association of Planned Parenthood. Every single patient we'd ever had came out in force. And, you know, one in five women in this country have been to Planned Parenthood for health care at some point in their lives. I swear to God, I heard from every single one of them. And that was, uh, and that really was what happened, I believe. Of course, now, it wasn't only our good organizing and our, and our allies. Sometimes it was our enemies. Um, I'll never forget, I was about to go on Rachel Maddow one night when Glenn Beck was on TV to say that only hookers went to Planned Parenthood for health care. Um, now, um, that was his excuse for why we didn't need it anymore. Well, it's very interesting because suddenly a bunch of non-hookers uh, who go to Planned Parenthood <laughs> started posting up on our Facebook page, right? Uh, just immediately. Uh, and there were a number of stories, but my favorite one was a woman from North Carolina who wrote, I guess he doesn't know that us military wives go to Planned Parenthood when the doctor on base can't see us, right? Uh, it was, as my mother would have said, uh, America singing. Um, and the beautiful thing was, despite the House of Representatives and Jan's best efforts and all the folks there, at the end of the day, the United States Senate voted to block the House's action. Uh, we, we beat the House's defunding bill 58 to 42. Every single Democratic member of the United States Senate voted in support of us, so I think we got to give it up for them. Um, but, but I do want to say, too, um, there were five very brave pro-Planned Parenthood Republicans who stood for us, including your own Senator Mark Kirk, who deserves our enormous thanks for that vote and that help. Um, but as any, you know, as any good organizer, you're always looking for the upside. The great thing is actually, uh, after all this, um, our approval ratings grew. More people knew who we were and what we did. And I don't like to think I'm a competitive person, but actually I am. And uh, so the polling after, after this whole thing was 69% of the American people supported Planned Parenthood. Uh, barely 9% supported the House of Representatives. So just do the math on that. It kind of worked out. And as, I mean, as Jan said, the most, I think really the most important thing is we did add two million new supporters to Planned Parenthood in the last two years. And that's right. And a third of them are young people uh, and they are registered to vote. And last November, they did. Uh, that was the important thing. We, we ran the Planned Parenthood Action Fund, the largest political program we ever had in our history and because we had to, because our run-in with Congress uh, showed us that if women aren't at the table, we're on the menu, uh, and that was our experience. So what we did, uh, the Action Fund, we thought tooth and nail to make sure that women's health care and women's rights were part of the national debate, and they were. 
And the most important thing to us is that folks who supported women uh, went back to Washington, and they did. Um, Senator Tim Kaine, Senator Elizabeth Warren, Maisie Hirono, Sherrod Brown, uh, you know, and I love that with a little bit of help from Paul Ryan, we not only carried Wisconsin for Obama, but we elected the first openly gay member of the United States Senate, Tammy Baldwin. That was fantastic. And, um, and in the toughest race, I think, in the Senate, we re-elected um, a, a farmer, organic farmer with a buzz cut from Montana who is a fierce champion. John Tester from the great state of Montana went back, which was great. And of course, here you did your job too with Sherry Bustos and Bill Foster and Brad Schneider and now Robin Kelly. Thank you for that. And of course, the incredible Tammy Duckworth who didn't just beat Joe Walsh, she walloped him, all right? So let's hear it for that. Um, and I, look, I know he's already gotten his fair amount of ink, but I just can't help it. He's the gift that keeps on giving. The great, one of the great election moments, of course, that night, there are a few more cathartic things than watching Congressman Todd Aiken's face when he learned that women had, in fact, shut that whole thing down, that that's what happened. Uh, but it was a year like that because between Joe Walsh and Todd Aiken and Richard Murdoch, you know, as Chris Matthews said, you know you're in trouble when someone asks, did the rape guy win? <laughs> and you have to ask, which one? That's the problem, right? So, the best news though, I think in some, <laughs> I love that line, I can't help it. Um, the best news is, I think, is that last November, uh, is that the American people got it right. And despite all the money, uh, despite everything, they got it right. And yet, try as we might, we just can't seem to get folks to move on from these issues about women. You know, mom used to paraphrase uh, Edna St. Vincent Millay, who said, you know, life isn't one thing after the other. It's the same damn thing over and over again. And that's how it feels in the state legislatures. We've had more than 300 bills introduced that would limit access to safe and legal abortion, birth control, breast exams, sex education. And I'm not gonna mention the list of horribles, but you gotta know this one. Just last month, Governor Brownback in Kansas signed a bill that is now you know, in Kansas that allows doctors to lie to women about amniocentesis results if they believe that information might influence a woman's decision about continuing her pregnancy. Yeah, this is literally a bill sanctioning uh, doctors lying to their patients. It's incredible. Um, so we gotta get busy. If mom were here, she would quote the Waco Women's Club motto that says, if we rest, we rust, okay? So here are the three things we got to do. Number one, we got to invest in grassroots organizing and no better place to do it, you know, and then uh, following the lead of Jan Schakowsky. Because it is true in these states, it is when people actually take action that things matter and when they change. Who could have imagined that Virginia would be someday be known as not only the home of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, but also the transvaginal ultrasound, right? So when this bill was introduced in Virginia, folks began to organize uh, and started to talk. And in a few days, actually hundreds of women and men and families, they, they joined together in Richmond, they linked arms and they formed a circle uh, around the state capitol in peaceful protest of this outrageous bill. Now, courtesy of Governor Bob McDonald, they were greeted by the state police in riot gear. But every single legislator had to walk through that line. And in the end, Governor McDonald stripped that requirement from the bill. That's grassroots organizing when it works. Um, and we have to, politicians have to know that if you want to run for office, you're going to have to answer to women. The second thing we have to do is use social media. And there's so many incredible examples. I mean, that is, that's our new best friend. 500,000 people in this country are following Planned Parenthood now on social media. Uh, from Planned Parenthood Save My Life, which was put up on Tumblr, a big shout out to Tumblr, which is a fantastic site for young women. But, you know, who can forget that in the middle of the debate over birth control, when Congress called a hearing and refused to let Georgetown Law student Sandra Fluke testify, because they said they needed experts, right? Well, uh, so we got the hearing, and lo and behold, None of the experts there used birth control because they were all men. So an enterprising Planned Parenthood staffer snapped a picture on their cell phone 
We posted it up to Facebook, and it had gone viral before the hearing was even over. It was fantastic. It was fantastic. Um, and the last piece is we have to invest in young people. And I'm so thrilled so many of them are here today because they are our best hope for the future. So forget about an enthusiasm gap. Do you know one and a quarter million more young people voted for Barack Obama last November than four years ago? OK, that's, that's a very little known fact. Um, today, Planned Parenthood, is, we've doubled our campus chapters. There's folks everywhere. Uh, and it seems like every day I hear another great story about some young person. But uh, I'm going to give you this one um, here at the end, like Caitlin Campbell. So this is a 17-year-old high school senior in West Virginia. So when Caitlin's school uh, tried to force her to attend an abstinence-only assembly, she didn't just refuse to go, she started speaking out. And then when her principal uh, threatened to call Wellesley College, where she'd been accepted for, uh, in the fall, to report on her bad character, unless she backed down, Caitlin went to the media. And her story picked up steam on the internet. And then Planned Parenthood, we shared her story on Facebook and within hours had thousands of likes for Caitlin. And finally, uh, Wellesley sent out their own tweet, which said, Caitlin Campbell, Wellesley is excited to welcome you this fall. <laughs> So that's what organizing is about. It's connecting the personal uh, and the political. Uh, that's what Jan's done all our life. And if we do our jobs right, um, it, it's about connecting to people who aren't following politics in the way that you and I are. Uh, in the second presidential debate, with more than 40 million folks watching, President Obama spoke more than once about the importance of Planned Parenthood and the life-saving work that our folks do every day. So a couple days after that debate, a young woman came into a health center in Houston, Texas, a Planned Parenthood center. Now, it had been several years um, since her last exam, but she thought she'd found a lump in her breast and she didn't know where to go. So the clinician welcomed her and she asked who sent her. The woman said, well, I heard President Obama say on TV the other night that Planned Parenthood does breast exams. That's change. Um, to me, that's what change is about. It happens when people um, come together and make it happen, and that's what you do. Who could have imagined that in our lifetime, we would witness a presidential inauguration and an address that would pay tribute to the folks who risked their lives fighting for these very freedoms. As President Obama said, we the people declare today that the most evident of truths, that all of us are created equal, it's the star that guides us still, just as it guided our forebears through Sel Seneca and Selma and Stonewall. <laughs> President Obama recognized these courageous fighters of the movements of the past, and today I want to add all of you to that list. Every era demands organizers, hellraisers, troublemakers, Folks who believe the future can and has to be better. Progress isn't inevitable, it's earned. It's what we do, and it's an honor to do this work with you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, thanks for what you do, thank you. And please join me in welcoming back the force of nature, Jan Schakowsky. Yay, forward. Thanks a bunch. Thank you. We are so lucky to have this woman as our leader and fighting for our rights. Thank you so much, Cecile. Um, before we uh, go about our business, I want to just uh, mention a couple of people I forgot. And this is your last chance, if I forgot you, Honorable uh, Lainey Berger, judge, and uh, Cindy Wolfson is uh, the elected Moraine Township trustee. But I, I want to thank all of you for coming. I hope you do feel more empowered and more energized and stronger than, than when you came in because we need every ounce of that and every person and so many more. So thank you. I am so grateful to you. I love you so much. Thanks for being here.